Chase Teller here at the Minnesota North Star Bowl in Wisconsin with uh, Team 2451 uh, Ponage. Ponage, every single year, has been building fantastic robots, and this year, definitely no exception to that. Take a look at Ponage and what they have to offer. They won the Excellence in Engineering Award uh, quite recently, so we'll be doing a full overview and detail of this robot as we go through their arm gripper. They got a cool uh, flip down that we'll be talking about a little bit as well, some cool geometry. Let's talk more about this robot and what goes into this incredible machine here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Kettering University is looking for talented robotics students who want to continue learning and innovating in a hands-on real-world experience format. Kettering University representatives will be at dozens of FIRST events this season, including the championship. Go to kettering.edu slash FIRST to see which events you can meet a Kettering University representative. FRC competition season is here. Submit your favorite moments to FRC Clips of the Week by each Sunday at discord.gg slash first updates now. Also, the FRC Top 25 poll is open Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern to Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern, where you can vote for your top 25 teams of the week at firstupdatesnow.com slash FRC Top 25. Elena, let's start out uh, on this robot here talking about you. You're doing something called what you call a battering ram. I'd love to hear more about that. And of course, uh, your intake as well, too. But uh, really love to hear the value of the battering ram, what you've been seeing uh, so far. This is your second event. You're still playing a third one as well, too. So talk to me more about the design behind it and some of the benefits of that. And we'll also talk about your intake. So when we were initially looking at the game, what we figured out was that there's like only a few paths that we could travel easily with because the charging station is in the way. So what we determined would be important for us this year was like maximum maneuverability. We wanted to open up the field. So what we did with that was we wanted, we decided to create a battering ram to help us get over the charge station. While we can travel over the charge station without it, it just helps both in during gameplay or like driving around. And it also helps during end game because when there's two robots on the charging station already, we can easily climb up without having to fight the angle. Um, so for this battering ram, we have this specific angle. This is the part that does the main um, pushing down of the robot, pushing down of the charging station, I mean. We also have it double as a docking mechanism because early on we had decided that we wanted to have our robot be able to mechanically dock and tell where it is on the grid. So this is our docking mechanism. We have like this plastic that like angles the robot into the hybrid node and we also have these two paddles with limit switches to let us know in auto whether we're lined up or not so they click like this and there's one on the other side um the main part of the battering ram will just be the angle over here we flip it down we're using gas struts that are over centered in a chain pull to bring it up and down and that's partly because early on we also determined that we didn't want to use pneumatics because it's a lot of extra weight and we wouldn't be using it in too many different places. I got a question for you on this. Uh, you know, when I, I see these types of battery rams, uh, which I don't think I've seen the other one this year, but it's very reminiscent of me of like going back all the way to like 2012 when you had like ramps as well. Did you take any inspiration from past games or other robots or anything like that? We did look a little bit at past games, but because this year had like a bigger ramp, what it was was just, we kind of wanted to open up the field and we we're like, oh, an angle would work. And we just tried it out, did some wooden prototyping, you know, cut it out on, wood and like rammed it did a lot of breaking yeah. stuff and we were like it works and it worked pretty well for us we put a few old robots on the charging station and we tested it with and without and we were like yeah this does have a use and it works very well for us so love it talk to me about as we start to follow up in that journey talking about your uh, intake what's gone into that and how it's working for yeah. you yeah so our intake on the other side if we could flip it down also has an angle on the end and this also doubles as what we call the anti-tip but it serves the same function as a battering ram um, going on it helps push and engage the charging station and coming off if we're going off fast it prevents us from tipping over because another could we did we had a lot of early on considerations and we didn't want a robot to tip over so having it out when we're going over and trying like traveling super fast we won't we won't need a tip I any mean, we won't tip over but the okay so for our intake we start with these green compliant wheels our little scooper as we call it initially starts down it's connected to a servo but it's got plenty of flex so the servo doesn't take any load and we funnel in a cube if you could do that we funnel in the cube um so just like that we have a we have a beam brake sensor 
right over here. And it basically tells us or the robot where the cube is. And as the so once it determines it has a cube, it flips up, the wheels rotate a little bit, and it feeds it into the gripper, which is where we get into the arm and scoring positions. Yeah, I mean, that's such a smooth uh, transition that you're doing. I, I just love to see how that went into that. And uh, let's keep moving on into that, Jeremy. I mean, you got a wicked arm here and an awesome gripper uh, and the wrist as well, too. So, Graham, talk to me more about what has gone into that and uh, how it's working out so far for your team. Because I watched it in the field, and it just seems so smooth all the way through. Yeah, so we're going to start at where everything is controlled from. So, hey, we're going to flip the robot here, and we're going to take a look at the underside of the robot. This is where most of our controls are. We have this belly pan that helps protect the robot. Um, and all of the working components of both the arm, the battering ram, and the intake are down here. So we can take a look at how the cube intake is controlled first. We have this chain and tube here, um, powered off of a Neo, that runs up uh, through here and into um, uh, this shaft here. It's controlled with gas struts for both up and down and over centers, so we take a lot of the load off of the motor itself. And the same technology is used for the intake as well to activate it up and down. Moving on to the elbow and shoulder, which is what we call the two stages of our double jointed arm. We have a single motor that controls the shoulder with a braking mechanism controlled by a servo. This, serv this braking mechanism allows us to again take all of the force off of our motors when we're holding an arm out for an extended period of time or holding it in our robot. The same technology is again used for the elbow, except we're using two Neos instead of one. This is so we can get some extra speed off of a lower gear ratio. Flipping the robot back up, we're going to take a look at the arm joints itself. So coming around here, we can see a large gearbox on the side of the robot. Um, this gearbox has two large sprockets. One of these sprockets is directly connected to the shoulder. So when this sprocket rotates, the shoulder rotates with it. And then the other sprocket is using a cable pole to move the elbow part of the arm. This was inspired heavily off of 971 Spartan Robotics robot from 2018, where they used a very similar technology. We 3D print these um, plastic ploys up here with our Mark Forge, and um, it's been the, both the elbow and the shoulder have been treating us very well throughout the season so far. I, I know you said you took uh, some inspiration in regards to your arm as well too, but there definitely seems to be a little bit of uh, custom work in that as well. Like, what did you take from that and kind of make it your own, so to speak? Yeah, so 971 used um, custom tensioners within their arm or within these pulleys to help them uh, tension the two cables. We decided to go with turnbuckles instead. Um, this was to allow pit crew to have an easier time accessing the tensioning, and it also allowed us to have to um, create less custom parts and less complex parts. Um, other than that, we uh, the braking system also, I don't believe, was on their robot. So that was something that we used to make it uniquely our own. Yeah, so we move on to the wrist here. Uh, can you drop the battering ram? So the wrist is how we control uh, the position of this of our gripper here. And this is a rel sim relatively simple design. We have a Neo 550 here with a relatively large uh, gear reduction on it, um, something that we was relatively interesting about how we did our um, wrist here is that we added some extra pins to our ultra planetaries. This allowed, um, this allowed us to run them at a higher reduction than they're rated for, so we're running them uh, much higher than the S than the recommended 45 to one, and it's been turning out well. It's been turning out well for us because of that. Uh, moving on to the intake or the gripper here, we, this is the current design. We're using a rack and pinion that we were able to fabricate with our wire EDM alongside our Bridgeport mills. Um, with a custom 3D printed block in the middle to help keep stability across the rack. And you actually changed that up from your last event, if I recall, right? Correct. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. Sure. Um, these two, we have two arms here that are. S yeah, let it go. So we have two arms here that are spring-loaded outwards, and we're able to um, self-center the cone. So we have no powered rollers on any of these rollers. They're all free-spinning sure. on half-inch thin wall tubing. Um, and then they're spring-loaded out with these two surgical tubes. We have, a, we have a couple sensors up here as well. We have a pot here to make sure we know where the rack is, as well as a proximity sensor here and a proximity sensor here to know when the game piece is there. So we start off with this design. This design was a powered wheel. Um, sushi wheel, sushi roller design, and we used belts for this. As you can see, we use things like bearings and aluminum shafts, and this ended up being a very heavy arm. Um, we also ran into an issue here with the 
uh, bearings cutting into our sliding plate. So originally on the first iterations of the design, we had one sliding plate that these two um, gripper, these two grippers would travel on. Sure. And then this was all controlled with the Neo 550 up here. Moving on to a future iteration, I can show you an intact one and a non-intact one. We had some issues with this breaking, but we used, and we can, currently we still use this technology where we have a single standing roller in here with a uh, thin wall tubing shaft. And then on top of that rolls a sushi roll, a half inch sushi roller. Uh, that's only held in place with the uh, bosses here that um, just help keep everything aligned. Uh, the issue we ran into this with this though is that we were using a shoulder bolt here and this shoulder and a shoulder bolt here. So this um, small gap and a lot of force caused the uh, 3D print to break at the layers and we had to go to something a little stronger. So to go to a little stronger stop, we break out this, which is an intact version. And we can see here that we're using a, um, we're using a back face on the gripper to help keep it centered. Um, from here, we're also using a cable pole rather than um, the chain pole or the rack and pinion that we're using currently. And this cable pole was working really well for us. It allowed us to um, force our grippers closed and then pull the whole thing in on the sliding belts. Um, but this had, again, some issues with braking, as it did a lot of our iterations. Uh, moving on to what we actually ran at Midwest a couple weeks ago, we have a chain pull here. This chain pull design worked really well for us, but we had a couple of uh, crucial issues with it. When the chain would go slack, the chain would bunch up in this cavity here and cause us not to be able to close or open the gripper again. Uh, we fixed that by milling everything out, but we still wanted to just make sure that it would never happen again. And that's how we ended up with the current design that is rack and pinion. And what are you seeing so far? Like you've played a couple matches. Uh, is it where you want it to be? It's exactly where we want it to be. It's fast out, fast closed, and it allows us to hold a lot of strength over it without hurting our motors at all. I love hearing about the iterations and the journey that you've taken through so far. And cool to just see that each, each little step has just gotten a little bit better for you. Uh, and, and we mentioned, you know, even after this event, you get another regional play too. So it'd be cool exactly. to see like, are you sticking with this? Are you moving to something else? But it sounds like it's working out pretty well for you. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about the uh, arm geometry as well, too. I'll show, I know we'll show a little bit about that on screen. Aiden, you're going to cover a bit more about that. So as we start the wrap-up in the robot, walk us through what you have on screen and how it's applying to your robot. Yeah, so this is an example of the robot grabbing a game piece from the feeder station. So this is kind of the movement. We have all these little lines here. This was actually um, a previous design. We wanted to have the ram or the intake kind of slowly move out as we went to grab a game piece so it wouldn't have to go all the way down but we found that the gas struts were just too strong and the motor just couldn't power it and fold it at that slight angle. So you can kind of see how the arm moves as one to fold in and fold out. Uh, the, the nice thing about this arm is that um, we're not using it based off of set points. So we are controlling each joint individually. So we're not telling you know the gripper to go to this X and Y coordinate. We're telling e each joint to go to different angles and that allows it to move much quicker so it doesn't have to wait on joints to get to where it wants to be. Can we showcase some of that too? Like I, I, I love your, by the way, your control grid that you're doing on, uh, on your driver station as well too. Kind of show us how that works out through the process. So we click these buttons based off of where we plan on scoring. And so for example, I'm going to hit the high cone button. And so now we are prepared to intake a cone. And now we pre-stage as we come up to the uh, grid and then we can score our cone. Yeah, so you can see that it moves pretty quickly. It almost tips the drivetrain sometimes. So we actually cannot move the shoulder any faster because if we do, then we start to get that tipping motion where it'll start to rest on the bumper or rest on one of the flip-flops. Um, another nice thing about a robot is that we use a lot of physics to calculate how the arm moves. So the arm has gravitational torques applied to it, which we calculate based off of a series of equations. So we plug in all the different angles for all the joints, and then we get out the torques applied so we can cancel them out, and that allows us to control it with a PID much nicer and faster. Um, you can see some teams, they have their arm jitter when it gets far out. That's not gonna happen here because we have these arm calculations. Well, opponents, really appreciate you taking the time. I mean, you have a phenomenal robot. All the cool stuff you've gone through, just the thought processes, the iterations, everything that you've gone through on this robot, super well designed, definitely deserving of the Excellence in Engineering Award that you got at the Midwest Regional. Uh, but I know we're looking for a win here, so we wish you best of luck at this event. Of course, at Smoky Mountains, and we hope to see you at World Championships in just a few weeks. Thanks a lot.
This video on first updates now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Kettering University is looking for talented robotic students who want to continue learning and innovating in a hands-on real-world experience format. Kettering University representatives will be at dozens of FIRST events this season, including the championship. Go to kettering.edu slash FIRST to see which events you can meet a Kettering University representative. FRC competition season is here. Submit your favorite moments to FRC Clips of the Week by each Sunday at discord.gg slash FIRST updates now. Also, the FRC Top 25 poll is open Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern to Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern, where you can vote for your top 25 teams of the week at firstupdatesnow.com slash FRC Top 25. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.